Thank you very much. Are we all set? Okay. Uh, well, it's a great privilege to be here. And uh, I will start maybe with some references to the talks of yesterday because I had really I urged uh, some kind of uh, questions. I was urged to ask some kind of questions and there was no time. So I apologize for <laughs> in, uh, kind of this intervention. And practically, uh, what I wanted to uh, take up on are a few issues. I really appreciate this idea of diversity and diversification of uh, approaches that we had. I was particularly struck with the fact that in China there are no slums. Yeah. So, like, did you know all this? <laughs> so, I mean, same thing uh, would be in my presentation. Again, you will see some kind of shanty towns, you will see some kind of, uh, yes, uh, segregation, and that's the point. But uh, how about this uh, uh, locality? And not, uh, maybe localization is the term I like to use often, not globalization. So how about this uh, diversification when we have uh, to analyze the local context of what comes out of it? That's maybe something that uh, puzzles me most. And how about the, the translation of the terms that we have in certain kind of context? Uh, I'm troubled really uh, with this metaphor of bazaar. I don't know if you understood the uh, bottom-up metaphor of bazaar that can be translated as a metaphor for the city. I mean, a bazaar is a trading place. I mean, it's like uh, in kind of my culture and in some cultures more south. It's a trading place. It's not a place of self-organization. So, huh, what can I say? <laughs> then again, uh, I'm, I'm also kind of, well, Miguel had really a strong point. And I will uh, add another poem, not Laurie Anderson, but Bob Geldof, you know, this band eight. Uh, Let them know it's Christmas, I cannot sing, sorry. Let them know it's Christmas time again. It's a great famine in Ethiopia. Okay, 40% uh, of Ethiopians are Muslim. Uh, there are 30% of Orthodox, but they don't celebrate Christmas because they are Orthodox Christians. They celebrate Christmas 12 days after or two weeks after. So who do they address? So I'm kind of trying to point out that there is still lingering on some perspective of the maybe a kind of Western if, or post-Western uh, view or glance on the things that are happening globally. And I will give completely maybe another kind of point. I'll start uh, from the scratch. Oh, I'll start from the stretch, from tabula rasa. I'll speak about New Belgrade. So there, there's nothing there, you know. <laughs> You see, there's the confluence of two rivers, and there's an idea of a city. And I think we have to go back to these models, to the models of, let's say, uh, communist or maybe socialist ideas, and we revisit them. Because we were speaking about, uh, uh, let's say, self-organization, but we had a very strong and developed model of socialist worker self-management. OK, it was top-down, yes. But I'll go through this. So what happened with New Belgrade uh, and why I'm saying all this? Because I have to uh, think about the different social contexts. I have to analyze it and I don't have solutions, of course, but I can come up with some terms together with the people that I'm working with. And one of those terms is urban feudalism. And I think it's like kind of maybe contradiction in Ajecto, but I think it's something that explains the situation that we are facing in uh, Serbia nowadays. Uh, to come to this point, I would like really to uh, introduce you to the concepts of new, concept of New Belgrade and how this concept was developed and how the capital of a new socialist Yugoslavia after the Second World War was envisioned. Because maybe some of you are too familiar with it. Mariette is a sure. I mean, and it's a great talk and I really appreciate it. Sorry to <laughs> repeat all this over again. But I think it's uh, important to learn from these examples, maybe they were bad, but let's go back to them. So uh, what is New Belgrade, you know? Now you see the confluence of two rivers and it's a cordon sanitaire, it's a borderline, it's the meeting point of two empires. Uh, on one side there is Austro-Hungarian Empire, on the other side there is Ottoman Empire. And then again, like speaking of bazaar, maybe a better, uh, coming from this uh, part of the Ottoman Empire, you know, maybe better term for community or maybe neighborhood would be 
uh, Mahala, I'm sure for you, you know this, and it's a more complex idea of a neighborhood. So we should appreciate all these differences when we speak, you know, that's my point maybe. I'll come to this later. Uh, so, and then what happened, the Second World War, you all know the consequences, is also a civil war, revolution, and here we have a good example of the socialist realist painter Boža Ilić, um, I would say a masterpiece really of uh, socialist realism. When you see all the uh, pillars of society, like a peasant, worker, partisan, a freedom fighter, etc., etc., they gather together to build a new capital, to build a new city for the socialist Yugoslavia. And they choose exactly what you've seen before, the swamp, the marshland, the tabula rasa, exactly the point where you could insert all this new ideological concept into space. And it, it was important to homogenize somehow all these kind of pillars of society, future society. And what happened? Okay, there were like architecturally, urbanistically, there were even plans before the Second World War how to build New Belgrade. Of course, there are always influences coming from uh, Le Corbusier, etc., etc. Uh, there was an uh, idea of a radiant city. But then there were some local contributions. There was one urbanist and architect, Dobrovich, who made a kind of tremendous master plan for New Belgrade. Uh, but to cut a long story short, there was an idea to make administrative acts as one of the main axes and to make another kind of culture acts. Those were two main axes that I want to focus on. The representation of this administrative acts was a kind of building of a palace of federation and now you see it and that's uh, the floor plan and that's how it looks. And that's like at the time, yeah, I like black and white photos, so there's no problem with <laughs> Google Photos. So that's when it was built. And finally, it opened for the first summit of non-aligned countries, where Yugoslavia was like strongly taking part as initiator. So uh, this building could be analyzed in many different ways. There was an idea immediately after 1948 to get rid of the uh, Stalin dictate. So there was a fight with Stalin. Yugoslavia had to find the third possible way to develop its own social system and somehow to, to find also this third way, a representation of this third way. And maybe this building, maybe now you would say that looking like a pentagon, but you know, <laughs> uh, it was the opposite of uh, another idea of the building of the central committee of the Communist Party that represented the sheer power from the start. So this ambiguous feeling uh, in between East and West, in between international style, and in between uh, the, uh, I would say, totalitarian architecture of Soviet Union was also theorized in architecture. So this is the building uh, representing the power. And then we go back to the culture acts. The culture acts was uh, very important because uh, the idea of the society and one of the leading principles was contemporaneity. And therefore, uh, what we have here, it's an urbanistic plan with five museums. Of course, regretfully, due to financial cuts and everything, there was just one museum that was built. And that was our museum, Museum Contemporary Art. And I'm really happy to, <laughs> that this building was the only one built. But there was another idea to build a museum of revolution, a partisan school to educate partisans, and then a uh, uh, kind of National History Museum, etc. So there's a kind of drawings and floor plans, the way museum was built, and the way it's looking now. And now, and now, and that's now. Museum is under reconstruction, but I will cut the long story short. You know, it's like a sad story. There are three uh, years uh, that the museum is being reconstructed now, and we never know when it's going to be over. Now I'll try to skip to uh, one movie. I don't know if I will manage uh, to find it in a folder. I would need some help. Yes. So, to see the museum and to see the context and what was the different in this society. It's a movie by Gianfranco Parolini, very famous Italian author in, from 1968, a filmmaker. We probably never heard of him, because it's a B production. And uh, three fantastic supermans. It was filmed in our building of the museum. You see the center of power of the Communist Party, you know, 
Palace Museum. And then, okay, American flags. The idea was that this could be like Manhattan, why not, you know? This could be filmed in 67 in Manhattan. Period of Cold War, Yugoslavia, Iron Curtain, all these things. So I think this is exception to the rule, in a way. So uh, just to see a bit of a uh, flavor uh, how this society was being produced and how specific it was. Maybe I sound to the idealist, maybe there were some kind of critical comments afterwards, but okay. So at the end, uh, what happened? Uh, the idea to make this administrative capital failed, of course. There was no money at what uh, it ended, and it was a failure of the socialist city. And here comes my uh, maybe uh, theoretical reference, so I'll do some readings, so I'm sorry uh, to be more accurate when I could. Uh, and this is the idea of Henri Lefebvre, who was very much involved, and I start and I'll end with his ideas because he was very much involved in the process of rebuilding of New Belgrade. In 1986, he took part with two French architects, uh, Anodin and Gibault, to do a project of reconstruction of New Belgrade. And I'm leaning uh, on his ideas because he was present, and I'm just not importing some kind of uh, uh, speculations or theoretical ideas that don't have a touch with the social system that we all analyze at that point. So, uh, already after the 50s, this entire concept of constructing an administrative center for the socialist country was abandoned. And the next two days, uh, mostly housing uh, blocks prevailed in New Belgrade, and this architecture was called architecture of existential minimum. Uh, the, f the failure to create a complex, multifunctional, spatial, urban structure produced a central space in the capital city, which remained as an economic, social, and finally a spatial void. So this is really important, you know. And this void created another kind of possibility to intrude and in kind of inflate, infiltrate another ideological concept. Uh, so New Belgrade has never managed to fulfill either the physical, the symbolic space envisioned by the Socialist Society of Workers' Self-Management. And this is a socialist uh, city, as is exemplified with the case of Yugoslavia, did not necessarily imply social housing, of course, and I'll have to analyze this a bit. But uh, most uh, cities that could be designed and such eventually developed into big settlements, mostly suburban settlements of block of skyscrapers that are often perceived similarly to dormitories. In Germany there is this term Plattenbau, of course. And uh, there was a lack of public space and all the facilities and uh, where the community or neighborhood could congregate. So I'll show you uh, how New Belgrade looks now. And it's mainly like uh, housing blocks uh, and you will see that's the kind of panorama on New Belgrade with some kind of new hotels. But, uh, so what happened and what was the main critical point for Lefebvre? He claimed that, as many other cities, Belgrade failed to realize the idea of the socialist city. And he was pleading uh, for socialist city. And he thought that exactly due to this system of worker self-management, Yugoslavia is the only country that has the possibility to develop a socialist city. And this way, uh, he accused zoning. The idea of zoning, which was based on the conception of morphological schemes, uh, that schemas that would have led to nothing but failure, both in social and urban terms. He stated that the decision to authoritatively separate, disjoint, and disarticulate, I quote it, the parts of the city would eventually kill it. So that was his argument. And then the housing policy implementing in the building of New Blair, Belgrade was reflecting the social conditions of public or social property in socialism. The basic premise was department is a common public good. So, and that's important like uh, infrastructure or park or any other public good. So the specificity of the housing function followed the ideological premise that a place, a residence, a partner in socialism is not only a commodity, but it is its use value which defines it. In theory, the right for such common public good and therefore right to have a resident was universal and connected to the ideal of distributive justice of common public goods. Legally, it meant that the right to resident apartment was basically the right to provides working men with one of the elementary conditions of living. Distribution of publicly owned apartment was basically served the ideal of free accommodation for all, and that's a basic principle. The state, therefore, had a primary role in providing housing for citizens. The principle was distribution, 
and in theory was following the idea of social justice. The ideal has, in the time, proven to be, uh, of course, uh, corrupted, you know, and I won't go into analysis why it has proven to be corrupted, I'll just stick to this kind of theoretical notions and concept, because there are many problems and, uh, of course, there are many kind of privileges, the communist oligarchy took all the privileges they can, etc. So in the first period of building housing blocks in New Belgrade, the basic organization in Munich of the housing zone was the housing micro-district. By the end of the 50s, the concept of planning and designing housing blocks in New Belgrade has housing community as a basic urbanistic unit. So this housing community, it can refer to Clarence Perry idea of a neighborhood unit. And there are some references, but it was linked in a, a socialist period to the local community and to the idea of a local community where the citizens would exercise their rights. So this is also important. And uh, uh, with the new law on housing communities from 58, the foundations were laid for organization and development of local communities and territorial units of, and forms of associations of citizens and self-management. So that's uh, the kind of concept behind it, you know. And I won't go further into it, maybe I'll just uh, skip uh, more theoretical analysis on this concept of local community to show you just one example of a block, of a housing block that was uh, kind of uh, that started from the end of 50s and it ended in 63. So it's like first and a second block, but they were not done chronologically, but they are block number one and two. So you see uh, how uh, the urbanistic plan was made. There was this kind of towers and there was like a more longitudinal building and there was the idea to create an orthogonal scheme. And that was what was the problem with New Belgrade. This kind of maybe boring orthogonal scheme that, and all the blocks that resemble each other. But with this block there was an exception. And that exception was this triangular structure. So for me this was rather important. And uh, this uh, block was called uh, Fontana, after the cinema and after the local community Fontana in this area. Because this broke this kind of dull and boring orthogonal structure. And uh, the way that it looks now, it's a bit kind of shabby, but of course, when you see that this was a place where there was a first cinema, and imagine that in this period, New Belgrade had more than 100,000 inhabitants, but only two cinemas. So where could people go? Where could people, like kids, can go? So there was like a market, there was like maybe some kind of version of a socialist department store. There was maybe a, a local community, and there were some other facilities, and, but the cinema was the most important. And what was happening, of course, this Cinema Fontana, how does it look now, <laughs> managed to sneak in and to make some pictures. So, and that's the idea. And for me, it was a splendid place where I wanted to uh, implement one project when I was working on a project related to the neighborhoods of New Belgrade, but there was no access. And that's another sad story, you know. So, uh, what happened? Uh, so this is uh, uh, the situation in the socialist period. Then in the 90s came the period that, which was known by wars, by destruction, demolition. And this would be too long story to tell about. But then uh, after uh, 2000, uh, after actually 92, there was the law on housing. And this led to privatization of approximately 95% of uh, publicly owned housing. But there was this kind of problem in socialism, in Yugoslav model of socialism. There was a state property, and then there was a social property. And no one knew what this social property means, you know. Okay, you know what is the state, <laughs> but what is the social property and who owns it? And uh, after this privatization and the law of housing from 92, uh, the housing blocks were sold at a price that was kind of rather symbolic, 25 to 50 euros per square meters. So anyone who got the privilege to get an apartment, and uh, most of the people did, uh, had the chance to uh, privatize them. But then again, the severe economic crisis, along with negligible transformations in all policy sectors, the withdrawal of the state from, from providing housing, and the lack of housing policy under Milosevic and his regime, led to considerable fail in uh, overall housing investment production as compared with the socialist period. Okay, there were small initiatives to give maybe to university professors some kind of, uh, let's say, housing, but then that was a kind of minor effort. 
In this situation, with no possibility for solving housing issue for almost 90% of those in need, uh, inherited from the self-help housing so the social, since the socialist period, uh, then uh, some other kind of uh, illegal construction started to uh, burst, and with like people in need, they needed to home. And that was a problem, because now uh, you would think, well, that's welcome, you know, that's self-organization, you know. But it was opposite. It was like uh, people who very rich that built on uh, land that was uh, something like uh, robbery, you know. They took it over and they built their villas. It was not <laughs> the way you analyze now, you know, and what we heard yesterday. So these illegal constructions were controlled by the leading political oligarchy, in a way. So that's a bit different, you know, plan. So, and the whole system was economically devastating. There was like the whole economy of destruction. This term was important because uh, the first it started with the robbery of people. Uh, there were this, uh, how this Ponzi scheme, you know, this like uh, scheme of uh, uh, getting, uh, let's say, 30% interest. If you invest money at the end, you don't uh, get anything. You end up with uh, being broke, you know. But then, uh, okay, that was like briefly the sketch and uh, in urban terms, like, in the 90s, uh, there is a good term from one uh, colleague, uh, Sergei Ivanovich Weiss, who called it turbo architecture, as a counterpart to turbo folk music, which was then an agenda. So what happened with the political changes that we all uh, expected uh, so long and we all fought, you know, so uh, against this regime of um, Milosevic, not all, but at least my generation. Uh, the urban changes, I would give a quote from uh, Professor Vladimir Matsura and Zlata Vuksanovic from the Town Planning Institute of Belgrade. In their paper on the new approach to social and functional mix in housing of Belgrade after 2000, where they claim that after political changes in 2000, social housing issues were present for the first time in the certain city documents. So everything started with the peaceful revolution, with throwing up of Milosevic, and with, yes, uh, the implementation of the new social system. So how this social system looks like. So they gave examples of the new master plan of Belgrade until 2021, uh, the program concept of building 5,000 units, uh, etc., etc. There is also architectural competition for social housing. And all of these documents, according to Matsar and Vuksanovic, constitute stage one of the project providing conditions for future building work. These documents are clearly defining what disadvantaged group of people are, and that's one important point. And these people are uh, the ones that are in need of social housing. So social housing is type of housing owned and funded by local authorities for the needs of disadvantaged groups. Finally, the special and comprehensive programs are designed to ensure inclusion, inclusion of these groups in society and all this is developed in legislation. So that's on paper. This progr programmatic text appears as if it was commissioned by authorities to prove that social and functional mix in Belgrade housing areas provides social cohesion, integration, and de ghettoization In social practice, we are witnessing in Serbia exactly the opposite is happening. And now I come to the other part, what is happening now, and what we are now living in Belgrade. So, in the period of post-socialism, the resulting thorough urban changes affected the city blocks in New Belgrade as well, be it in the direction of gentrification or, as it often happened, towards socio-spatial transformations into urban ghettos. After the political changes occurred in 2000, the earlier failure to realize the concept of a full urbanization in New Belgrade made possible the creation of new social paradigms to be inscribed in this space and in urban structures. So, and then I come to the point, uh, what are these driving forces that are shaping up the city now? And these driving forces are, for one, neoliberal capitalism, or I would use this term, uh, maybe predatory capitalism, and finally, why not urban feudalism? That would be like the epitome of all these kind of things that are happening now. But it's not just this, it's the perverse marriage between this uh, kind of capitalism, which is very specific, and I think there are very specific cases of capitalism uh, throughout the globe, and uh, with the, this perverse marriage with the radical orthodox Christianity. So what are the changes, and what we are witnessing now is, of course, too familiar to all, this kind of, uh, yes, housing blocks, shopping malls, 
uh, supermarkets, etc., etc. And this is what New Belgrade is turning into. This spatial void, and uh, this is another example, churches, there are five churches, because in communism you didn't have the need to go to church, of course it was like a taboo topic, but now there is a need. And finally, I showed uh, one local community, and I show, uh, to end up with this, the stratification of, let's say, the way social space has been produced in the last two decades in Serbia and before that in Yugoslavia. So the local community, the relict, but also the future possibility for the citizens to use is the lowest one. Then comes the B92, which was famous, you know, uh, civil resistance against Milosevic, radio, TV. Now, after they got this uh, Freedom of Speech MTV award, they became no less than a private corporation. And just on top of it, Raiffeisen Bank and one of these transitional banks and their A-class offices, of course, for their clerks. Uh, another aspect that we are witnessing is, and what I would like to stress the most, is uh, the kind of segregation. So the segregation is happening on many different levels. So this is university block, but uh, what is the privilege of uh, people from the university, well, not to blame them, is they have similar uh, uh, to what we've seen, uh, but not so luxurious, gated community. Their children can play safely. And this is exactly the opposite of the idea of New Belgrade, of the vast play space, of the vast transition or, or intrinsic spaces where you can meet and we can go out. And then there is also a racial segregation, I would say. And this is uh, another point. And there's like a block 70 where you see the Roma community, uh, the Chinese community, sorry, because uh, it's their trading place. But they all were somehow pushed into this block. Yeah. And then there uh, is an issue that's one of the most urgent uh, these days, and that's the issue of the Roma community. So what is happening is uh, this situation, as I said at the beginning, you will see in many different cities. So I don't know how to describe it. It's like uh, shanty town or uh, whatever. But then, uh, when you see, there is a possibility, and I'll come back later to this. There is a possibility, and I don't remember if anyone uh, uh, yesterday mentioned this word empowerment. You know, I think that uh, the trade of the Roma people is like getting and collecting the cardboard. So why not the uh, city should give them this kind of uh, bicycles to do their own economy? And we all appreciate it. It's also, it's important. It's ecologically correct, if you want. But then I will speak afterwards against political correctness. But please allow me to go fast through this. So these are the blocks uh, uh, where the Roma uh, settlements are. And then we come uh, to the fact uh, and to the situation, uh, what is urban feudalism? And how this social space in Serbia was produced? So it's being produced in particular symbiosis of business and politics where politics is more and more a tool in the service of profit and unofficial support for setting up the monopoly of companies as well as controlled media. The purpose of this media, apart from advertising products and political programs, is to contract, develop, construct, develop, maintain loyalty to, to the standards of community and public opinion, which glorifies and supports the newly established system through production and stimulation of consumers' desires fake but socially and nationally desirable identities. And what are these identities? So, war profiter is presented as a successful Serbian businessman. Then, war criminal as a national hero. Athlete or turbo folk music star is an important figure in culture. And in a devastated country, there are the new heroes of the nation, these are the sportsmen, particularly sportsmen who smedal substitute for the failures in everyday life of citizen. And that's the situation that we are facing now. But there are the, the, too many facts of the production of social space in this context, and they will be uh, seen in New Belgrade in this fast period of urban restructuring. As when I uh, was going fast through this, you see this. There's a new ideology filling up the empty public space, and there is a segregation. And this segregation is happening uh, while we speak. And now we come to this urban feudalists. So, 
this is a painting one, uh, one uh, artist and who is quite uh, actually uh, politically engaged. And this is one of the big bosses. This is one of the urban feudalists. And he painted him. It's like, I was kind of, uh, yeah, how should I say, mesmerized, or is this the right word? I was really kind of drawn to this image, you know. He's hypnotizing, you know. It's like, uh, yeah, that's the guy who owns uh, half of Serbia. And now you see him behind this uh, block, Delta complex. It's one of the first, and actually the first shopping malls. And he's, I think, listed uh, 800 something on the Forbes list of billionaires worldwide. So, where the money come from? It could be another lecture. But uh, yeah, the money is coming from uh, Milosevic period. It was like one of the pillars of his money laundry, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yeah, now he's respectable businessman, war profiter, respectable businessman. That's how it goes. But he's controlling uh, all political parties whatsoever. So there is no uh, problem, you know, he was uh, the one that paid, pays the campaign of uh, the opposition, the position, the ones in charge, and he controls them all. So that's uh, how it goes. So this is, uh, yeah, the president of Serbia, Boris Tadic. And like, of course, he's listening to this guy, you know, as you can see. And then finally, uh, Delta City, that's the big shopping mall that he built. And you see him as, um, well, Sin City, of course. And also, this is his uh, uh, CO, a very well, good-looking girl that left him a bit, uh, regretfully to form her own <laughs> company. And then those are the politicians behind with guns and etc., etc. You know, This is how it's looking, you know. So Delta City and... Uh, Yes, and the other one is transforming the building of the Central Committee. Imagine, imagine this. This is the building of the Central Committee of the Communist Party being bombed in 1999. So you see, uh, by NATO, of course, I had, don't have to forget this. So uh, this building uh, was really so strongly constructed. I don't know technically how to explain this because it was a swamp. There were some regulations. There were some kind of buffers. But Okay, and uh, it was preserved. So just three top floors were cut, and uh, it was a, a, let's say, privatization or maybe the corruption of the year, maybe even of the decade, because this guy, unlike the other guy that likes publicity, is the other opponent in this like Wild West fight, you know, gunfight between two urban feudalists. Who will prevail? This is keeping a low profile. One of the rare photos of him, Peter Matic. And he took over this company and built, of course, the business center. But then that's a projection of it, you know. He was not satisfied with the lot that he got because lot is private property. No, no, he wanted more. He wanted to uh, conquer the whole space, to build the uh, biggest, and that's Serbian megalomanic. He wants the biggest shopping mall in the Balkans, of course. And he wants twin towers because New York doesn't have them, so he wants them, you know. <laughs> well, sorry. So far, this is uh, what is being built. And then we come uh, to the settlement of Belleville. Uh, this is the settlement that was built uh, for the Student Olympic Games. And the one in charge was the first one, Mishkovic, the one that likes publicity. And he's the one uh, that could be also uh, our case study. Belleville, OK. A very nice neighborhood in New Belgrade very controlled, with all these kind of, uh, let's say, housing blocks that resemble, they take names after flowers, sunflower, or, yeah, I don't know, rose, or iris, or something like this. It's very poetic, and it's very utopian, so that's how it should be. And it's really kind of beautiful. Uh, yes, you can take uh, uh, a waiting list, you, you have to apply to get the residency there to buy the apartments, but I will give you some facts and why this is important. So, uh, this uh, housing block was uh, produced exactly on the occasion of the Students Olympic Games. And this happened in 2009. And Delta, Delta Company and the adjacent new settlement of Roma people will be the, one of the case studies that I want to show. So the company is owned by this uh, Miroslav Mishkovic uh, uh, feudalist, and uh, for this project, uh, one of the branches of Delta Company, Delta Real Estate, together with Hypo Alpe Adria Bank, formed a new Block 67 Associate. So these are these 
subcontractor, these are the smaller companies, etc., etc., and they will be in charge of building, building Olympic Village for the students. And I will skip their propaganda, maybe there was no time to hear some of their propaganda because it's very interesting. But the apartment sale started on July 2nd uh, in 2008, and the price was set at uh, almost 2,000 euros per square meter. The global economic crisis that started soon after, the real estate market in Serbia uh, kind of collapsed drastically, so it affected also the prices of the market. So, and according to uh, Journal Blitz in 2010, uh, there were just uh, 380 unsold apartments, so the market was not growing, really. So, shame for him. <coughs> but, this was one of the most expensive uh, blocks besides the one uh, near the sport hall arena, and I see no purpose, because, I mean, uh, it's obvious that this was a fisher business, but we got this tender. It was obvious that this is not high quality build, and even in comparison to the idea of a London Olympic Games, where there's a statement that uh, this would be in future affordable housing, maybe it's a trick as well, <laughs> yes, but that's the difference. They don't care, you know, <laughs> they don't even care to publicly have these kind of tricks. So he said, this is the best and most luxurious housing estate, so buy it for 2,000 euros course, and then the plumbing system collapse, and there are all the kind of glitches, etc., etc. But what do they do? They do very politically correct actions. So this is one of the uh, social responsibility PR actions. So they installed a uh, three tons uh, large ice cube, and they asked the citizens to guess how much time does it need to melt. And that's, yes, let's all deal with the global warming, you know, this is affecting us all. So let's send SMS, you know, no, 50 dinners, it's not much, you send SMS, and yeah, give us, uh, yes, the number, give us the number, and the one who got the number got the credit card with 1,000 euros bonus. So, great. Many workshops, uh, ecologically uh, workshops were conducted, etc., etc. But then again, just next to it, it's a Roma settlement. And these Roma settlements, of course, you've seen in, in many cases, looking like this. And there were numerous cases where authorities tried to remove them, and there were really numerous cases where legislation was fighting strongly to completely demolish this uh, housing of Roma people, these uh, temporary settlements. Most of them, or not most of them, but the big majority, are coming as refugees from Kosovo. So there, it's a very complex situation, and uh, I would say that no one is really taking care of it. So you see, they're being fenced, uh, put behind the fence, and when the student Olympic Games happened, uh, yeah, they said uh, when the students came and saw this Roma settlement just next to their uh, Belleville beautiful uh, housing block, well, they said, okay, this is a scenario for a film. Maybe, not to sound too nasty, maybe for Emir Kusturica's film, so if you know his films. So, and that was a kind of uh, trick, yeah. Well, this is a set for a film. D don't bother, you know. they're, they're not just Roma people. But what is happening, uh, they're providing temporary housing for them. And this is important. So, they're removing them to, uh, let's say, uh, completely outskirts. Some of them are removed to uh, south of Serbia. Some of them are completely dislocated. Some families were even separated because they were forced by, uh, to move them by trucks. And I won't give you all these arg arguments and answers because now I'm running out of time. But this is the most important situation, uh, what they provided with. Some families got these containers. Okay, some of them even said they're happy. But then because of this uh, non-announced and uh, really harsh decision by the mayor himself, who said, well, we need to build infrastructure. And that's the priority. We need to build bridges, so remove them from this area around bridges. There was a protest. And here I, I have uh, to give you some more kind of, let's say, input to this idea how this protest could work. Because this is really now, for me, a question as well. What is the role of the activists and the artists? Marietica gave a very good definition of artists as mediator. But uh, I have a troubling kind of situation is the role of the artist to be also a social worker? Or can the artist engage with such a community and to empower them? Or just organize few meetings 
organized kind of some protests together, organized a screening for them, and there was a whole scene and the whole alternative scene called other scene in Belgrade, they united to form petition against our common uh, citizens, Roma people that were being evicted, that were being removed, the settlements were being de demolished. And I see this protest and petition as really positive thing. But uh, as an artistic intervention, I don't see that there is a potential to go really deep into the community, to really empower them. And that's something that I need to lay, actually leave open. And finally, because uh, I mentioned a few actions for social justice, uh, that's how I call them. And these actions were really important, and these are in a fragile, let's say, self-organized system in Serbia, they're really important, so I won't be too critical of them, but uh, I would like to uh, maybe skip all these examples and end again with Lefebvre with maybe some more optimistic or maybe some kind of more theoretical contribution because as I said I don't really have solutions. So, uh, and we discussed also, Marietica mentioned this, what is the role of the citizen now regarding the state? And here I will quote some Lefebvre again. In the turmoil of a rapid and wild urban transformations of New Belgrade, the question that uh, Lefebvre himself had posed when he reflected the idea of a new citizenship still linger on. How to find new relations between the individual, society, and the state, and how to redefine citizenship within the vagaries of globalization or mondialization, as he called it, taking into account both immigration and migration, which continue to shape up the urban, social landscapes, and the new forms of belonging. Lefebvre's plea for the new citizenship itself related strongly on the right to difference, and I emphasize this, and the right to self-management. So, from this historical, like some years ago, uh, examples, we should really uh, try to relocate them into different contexts and revisit them, maybe. So he was seeking new rights for the citizens. This included the rights to information, free expression, culture, identity with difference, again, equality, self-management, city space, and its services, among others yet to be defined. In the text submitted for this international competition for new Belgrade urban structure improvement, Lefebvre elaborated on this new role of citizen in the following way, and I quote, the right to the city comes as a complement, not so much to, right, uh, to the right of men, like the right to education, to health, security, but to the rights of the citizen, who is not only a member of a political community, whose conception remains indecisive and conflictual, but more of a precise grouping which poses multiple questions, the modern city, the urban. The right leads to active participation of the citizen, citadin, uh, he, he said, in the control of the territory and in its management, whose modalities remain to be specified. It leads also to the participation of the citizen, citadin, in the social life linked to the urban. It proposes to forbid the dislocation of that urban culture, to prohibit the dispersion, not by piling the inhabitants and users on top of one another, but by inventing in a domains and level of the architectural, urbanistic, and territorial. I find it quite relevant still. In the local context, one of the crucial aspects for avoiding economic, ethnic, or racial, or social spatial segregation fostered by the predatory capitalism of today it, this is the potential for new types of self-organization in local communities. And if Lefebvre defined self-management, or autogestion, he said, as knowledge and control at the limit by a group, a company, a locality, of area or a region, over the conditions governing its existence and its survival through change, it is to this position and to this notion of self-management that different social groups may be able to influence their own reality and even to fight for spatial justice. And here I found that there is a potential, and I see that there are some examples of some, let's say, small NGOs already taking use uh, for the programming of these local communities, and I see that nucleus and some forms of self-organization within the Roma community, and not just, uh, let's say, politically activists correct, correctly or clapping their hands, and yes, yes, we're gonna help you, you know. So, that was it. Zoran, thank you very much.
take a glass of water if you need it for that very uh, concise and well-balanced uh, presentation between a very practical uh, look, both historical and practical look, at the, the condition and situation in New Belgrade, coupling it to Lefebvre's uh, theory. Um, it's, it seems that the, uh, the, the, sim the symbolics of spatial representation, spatial um, um, containment, I suppose, is a very reoccurring uh, theme in the in the the image in the lecture you just gave us in these images. The Roma town has very much this aesthetic of of this disorganization, the the cleaned uh, architecture of of New Belgrade when it was first realized, and the new projects coming in now really representing this new wealth, this reinstatement of of, of power. Um, is there a, a discussion going on also in Belgrade on, on these issues, not just amongst artists, but also architects uh, who are, are they conscious or not, in what role they play in, in this representation, in this power? Yes, of course there is a discussion, but uh, yeah, I would say that, uh, well, not to insult architects, but it's a great opportunity for them to build. You know? <laughs> So they're more into this kind of entrepreneurial association with the landlords and with the uh, investors. So that's majority. But there is a group of architects that are mostly theoretically oriented that are really aware and there did many projects. And not to name all of them, I will forget some. I think it's rather important because they're the ones that are raising these issues in the public sphere. I ask also because I noticed, uh, and to borrow a little bit from Yetika's presentation, this, this notion of uh, the organic in this, uh, through the local community. If you look at, uh, for example, the situation of the Roma, what's the solution they come with? They come with very uh, rigid, straight-lined, contained uh, units once again, when obviously there, there is actually a demand for something else. And I would imagine not just the Roma, but other people who would be moving, young families who have new ideas about what they need uh, in, in everyday life aren't looking for this, this rigidness any, anymore. It, it, there must be more potential in that, I wonder. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I see a lot of potential, but I, it's still, as I said, it's too fragile, you know. So all these initiatives, there were some, maybe this is a good example because like this protest and this petition where many different NGOs joined in and in front of the city assembly, they tried to uh, push this petition. Uh, it slowed down uh, the eviction of Roma in this block 67. So this was partially a success, in spite of the fact that, let's say, some 400 families were removed. But still, they remained there, and they're annoying the yuppies living in Belleville, you know. <laughs> um, open it up to the audience uh, quickly. We've proved to have a very curious audience at the last presentation. There's a question. Don, I owe you a question. <laughs> I'm listening. Yeah. Thank you, Zorin. Um, there are a couple of things I found really jarring in what you were saying. The first is you talked about the wonderful self-organization of the wealthy in uh, Belgrade. And then um, you talked about the, the new urban feudalists. And then you ended with Lefebvre and his list of those who ought to have the right to engage in the self-management of their own conditions of possibility. And among those was the company. Uh, the company. And that's, a, that's very jarring, especially coming from the states where our Supreme Court in its infinite wisdom has given uh, corporations all the rights of citizens without, of course, any of the uh, other responsibilities that go with that. And so how, is, is this a slip on Lefebvre's part? Is this the limits to his politics? How do we begin thinking about uh, the, the uh, political struggles that must be engaged within um, a struggle for the rights of the city when even Lefebvre seems to associate those rights with the company, and perhaps then the oligarchs. Uh, if you mean a company by a kind of a corporate company, or? Yeah, OK. OK. Yes, well, uh, that's very interesting, uh, because uh, uh, while reading Lefebvre, I think that his uh, assumption was that uh, uh, his theory is only valid in a capitalist system. So that's another point. But then I go back to the story that I said. Uh, he was very much attentive and um, uh, kind of present at the Korchula summer school of praxis philosophers, as many other kind of theorists did. And there uh, he invented a term that is very important for me. 
uh, to describe the whole metaphor for the maybe social system, and that's kind of Dionysian socialism. So that's uh, something that he spoke about. But uh, uh, translating Lefebvre's ideas are based exactly on the criticism of a failure of a Yugoslav system, because he had high hopes for the new socialist city and the idea of a new urban, the way he described it. And uh, therefore, I find uh, this quite useful as an insider view. You know. I don't think that, yeah, Lefebvre might have been a capitalist, okay, as he said. <laughs> but still, uh, his suggestions uh, in conjunction with maybe the idea of uh, Ed Soja, the spatial justice, is something that really would need to dwell on. And I think that there is a potential uh, that is still fragile, again, I repeat, uh, to self-organize and to use these facilities that were then instrumentalized but top down, but to use them bottom up, because they are there. And they will be either privatized or they will be uh, completely neglected. So most of the local communities, for example, I mean, like, it's a beautiful word. When I was walking around New Belgrade with that soldier, he said, well, this, uh, it's a really beautiful word. It's a toponing that could be really something like uh, uh, stimulating for the citizens to exercise their rights. And before, in socialist period, the people were exercising their basic civil rights, going to vote, uh, going to, I mean, for one, of course, person, you know, <laughs> but then uh, going to the balls or to parties or whatever, especially the officer balls. So uh, I think uh, there is a huge potential in using already existing infrastructure from the socialist period and not just reinventing or occupying the devastating areas uh, of the, uh, let's say, capitalism that we're facing now in transition of the destroyed and demolished country. I don't know if I'm getting to the point, but yeah, I, I have no better answer. <laughs> and, and how does that relate, just to get, you mentioned the church briefly, uh, as a typology, the church is, uh, in, as a social fabric, plays a very important part in communities. Um, that, that is a post-socialist uh, uh, manifestation in, 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 in sort of the, the new Serbian society, but it, it obviously plays a double role, as I understand. It has, it has a lot of wealth and a, a lot of influence. Um, is there a potential in, in that as a, as a system? Well, this would be another of my favorite topics, because I think uh, church, uh, really, all co it's not the church, I mean, as an institution, but there is so much uh, corruption, there is so much pedophilia in the church, and no one can really do anything about it, you know. And, I mean, re there are cases, you know, I mean, there, it's like in newspapers, you can see, it. some artists even reacted to this, they made a uh, scandal out of this kind of pedophilic case in, with one priest. So uh, the church is really a strong driving force after this collapse of collective identity. You know, when the country collapsed, there was the need to find new identities. Maybe uh, church and religion has proven to be one of the strongest. Besides the Democratic Party that took over, they introduced this neoliberal model, and then uh, together with more conservative uh, uh, parties like Democratic Party of Serbia, which uh, Prime Minister Kostunica at that time, they were leaning so much on church. So that's why I call this perverse marriage between these two. And uh, the other side, the church is sheltering and uh, even nurturing the most radical, if I may use this term, even fascist groups that attack uh, gay pride, that demolish the city when there is some kind of uh, uh, NATO uh, possibility of a meeting in Belgrade. So, hooligans, so, uh, you could say. Sorry? A type of hooliganism. Well, they're not a proper hooligans. They're instrumentalized young people by these ideological positions, especially by the church. And church is giving them shelter. So I think, therefore, the, the, uh, the church is shaping up in the same manner this social space. And that's troubling me the most because, I mean, uh, what is then the position of resistance? So for me, like, uh, if you say in 2000 when we got rid of Milosevic, if you say, yes, uh, okay, we all uh, took part in some kind of uh, protest, I took, let's say, two years of my studies to go to the street, etc., etc., and what came of it? We uh, were witnessing privatization, corruption, and, and any scale of the system. 
So I didn't give you much of examples. There was no time for this, you know, and the figures, how much money these people are earning by these political games. You know, they privatize for 10 million this building of central committee and then sell it for 40 million. So it's like kind of really <laughs> master business, you know. So what I wanted to say is uh, uh, when you take a critical position after the political changes and you say, well, this is bullshit what you're doing. You are introducing kind of cruel predatory capitalism. You would say, yeah, but you're radical. You belong to this Sheshel, you know, this uh, guy that is still in The Hague, you know, like this radical party. You, you belong to the Milosevic party, you know. So there was a schizophrenic position of uh, no possibility for a critical voice against the new democratic system because then everything was possible. And that's why I wanted to say I'm really against political correctness, you know. When we took care of all this, you know, and this in more developed countries like Netherlands, this is of, of course okay, you know, but when you take a care of all this, what is happening, you know, you take care of all the minorities and everything that goes without saying. But then if you take too much care of it, you neglect that uh, corporations and capitalism, neoliberal capitalism was going behind your back and destroyed everything, you know. So that was something that we want to focus on at the same time. You have to be aware, yes, we fight for the right of Roma people, we fight for the right to self-organize, we fight for the right of LGBT population, yeah, but first and foremost, these are these two urban feudalists that we need to fight against, you know, that's my agenda. Uh, questions, statements? Oh, sorry. I don't know if it's a question, but it's a comment uh, to this about the artist as a social worker. My name is Joanna Sandal, and I have a residency program in a modernist um, housing uh, complex in Sweden, Stockholm. And I just invited Vladan Jeremic and Rena Rado um, from Belgrade to have a discussion of, on the Roma settlements. Um, and what we've done is to create a kind of discussion room in the residency where we invite the public officials, the civil servants, so that in a sense we are debating with them and educating them in a more global discussion so that they can do their job even better. And now we're looking at perhaps creating a, a residency or a, Gladan will look into that in, in uh, Bewell. So I think that's just a little comment. I don't think artists should be the social workers. It's uh, maybe the institutions need to think about how can we um, work as kind of um, uh, strengthening their ideas and bring it back into the civil society and um, create a change. Okay, that was more of a statement, yeah. Yes. <laughs> but you said you don't, you don't have answers. You said it in your presentation, no, but this I is have, a potential. Uh, no, I have answers, you know, if you want me to answer. So you don't want me to answer. <laughs> you can answer it later or now. Uh, any other statements or questions? No? Okay, then in regards to time, Zoran, thank you very much for being here today and for your presentation. <laughs>